Sitting here good. All right. Um, oh, one thing for starters, just so I don't forget, because this has come up a couple people, what to take next. Um, so this is specifically within computer science. Uh, so if you're in 250 now, the if you're a CS major, you have to take CSC 300. Uh, if you're an IT major, you do not. Um, but CS major, I, I personally, I recommend that everybody takes CSC 300. Um, your upper division classes are going to be more difficult for you if you don't take 300 even as an IT major. I always promote that it should be required, but we can only have so many required courses, so it falls into that. Take it as one of your upper division electives as an IT major, and you cover your bases. It is more programming stuff. Um, uh, I know some of you hate programming, but just so you know, it's extremely common at this point for you to hate programming. Uh, because at this point, it's still very difficult for many of you, right? So that's normal. <laughs> it's normal for you to hate it at this point because it's not fun and you feel like you, well, it eventually will be fun, but you feel like it, you suck at it. I always uh, tell people it's, it's like golf. Um, golf is one of those sports that seems like it shouldn't be hard, but it is hard for some crazy reason. And when you suck at golf, it's not that much fun because you're out there whiffing and chasing the ball in all sorts of places, losing it in the woods, and it's not any fun. But once you get good at golf, then it is fun. And you focus more on the drinking, okay? And how how competently can you play golf with like a lot of alcohol, okay? Off campus, of course. <laughs> so, uh, in any case, I would uh, encourage uh, those of you who are frustrated with the uh, programming stuff not to give up. You will eventually find it fun and realize that it's a uh, skill that's worthwhile. Hopefully, you uh, saw some of that uh, with some of the senior seminar. Um, uh, presentations um, that you know some of these people put together something that's fairly legit and uh, I can tell you a lot of those people were not very strong programmers years ago um, probably a, one of the best examples and we him and I talked about it publicly in front during his presentation the other day is uh, one of our students Nick Yenter um, you know I would say as the beginning of the semester I would call him a fairly weak programmer even as a senior um, he put together a pretty legitimate um, e-commerce type iPhone app for uh, folks who are uh, like like street vendors selling hot dogs and stuff like that, where they can scan QR codes, it bills through PayPal. I mean, he, there's lots of moving parts to that thing that he spent a lot of hours this semester putting together. But finally, kind of everything clicked for him. So, and I would have said that he really sucked at the beginning of the semester. I wouldn't have expected him to be able to do that, and that was a a uh, big deal. So eventually, it'll catch on, <laughs> and you'll end up finding it uh, fun and amazing yourself and things like that. Uh, but anyway, CS majors have to take CSC uh, 300. This will be in the spring of 2017. Now, before that, you're going to be taking CSC 250. Every one of you is going to take that. CSC uh, 250. Um, so this is fall 2016, fall 2016, um, so then the elective for, so this is spring 2017 elective, that'll be that. Um, and one of the big reasons that I point to 300 as being fairly important is all of you have to take CSC 370 which is software engineering. Um, so that becomes kind of a, a weird twist. Usually CS students take 300 and 370 simultaneously. This is offered in spring 2017. Um, so you're kind of in programming mode. If you're an IT major, you are not in programming mode. Now, having said that, software engineering is not a programming course. It's a what does it take to put together a large software project course. So there's lots of roles other than the programmer. There's project management. There's uh, um, uh, 
uh, team lead. There's there's different roles for doing that. So uh, a, a relatively small-ish percentage of what you do in there is actual software stuff. Um, well, actual programming stuff. It's all related to how do you put together a software project. But in any case, these are the next several classes you'll be looking at in the uh, CS major. There are some other classes you can take as well, but um, in the fall, you should be taking 250, and then in the spring, um, I would expect most of you to take 300 and all of you to take 370. All right, questions about that? I know that came up a bunch of times. Yeah. So would you say it's strongly recommended to take together? That's, everybody does that. Yeah, otherwise you lose E. You, you, I don't think there's three. I don't think 370 is a prerequisite for uh, any of the upper division courses, but it's definitely a requirement for the major. And your best, the best time to take it is when you're kind of in programming mode. You'll be using computer programming in your upper division classes uh, because it's assumed to be a competency. We assume you 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 know how to uh, how to do some programming, um, but you aren't necessarily doing programming assignments every week and that kind of stuff then. So that's probably the, uh, taking it concurrently with 300 is probably your best chance of getting a lot out of the class because you're already in programming mode, whether you hate it or not, you're in, you're in, you're in programming mode, so you might as well uh, get it all out of the way at once. So yeah, you definitely take these concurrently. I think it's pretty rare not to. Um, and a lot of folks find 370 to be a relatively, um, it's weird because uh, a lot of our students hate programming until they don't, but then they find 370 boring because it's not enough programming. Um, but now what's interesting about 370 is it kind of is the, the proof of concept that computer science is not programming. I like to say it's kind of like the tool that we use, you know, it's a, kind of like a hammer is to a carpenter you know, the whole toolbox might be to a carpenter. Um, so 370 kind of shows you that there's a whole lot more to creating a software application than just writing the code. And we've sort of seen that in here when we draw pictures and kind of come up with our algorithms and stuff like that before we ever actually write a line of code. When, when we actually get to the point where we're writing the Java, that should just be, you know, spinning out syntax as opposed to solving the problem. We should have the problem already solved by the time we actually start writing the syntax, which then allows us to go down this path of using the right tool for the job. If you're writing an iPhone app, solve the problem first, and now we're gonna convert our human solution into Swift or Objective-C. You're doing Android, you're doing Java. If you're doing web, you might be doing JavaScript, Angular, stuff like that, but you know, whatever. You, know, you can choose the technology that is the, the right tool for the job once you've solved the problem agnostic to the technology. All right, anything else about the, go ahead. Uh, 250 will be Java, uh, and we actually start using Android Studio. So we'll do that in the context of Android apps. Um, historically, we just did Java, plain Jane Java in 250 and 300, but what we've done uh, the last two years is we've actually started the Java core in 200. Um, so historically, you imagine this, we would have used a tool like Alice for the entire semester. Um, but now we start around midterm and introduce Java as a kind of, let's say, baby steps, um, which then allows us to get into 250. And we're still learning programming concepts, but we start learning it in the context of maybe a, a more um, applicable skill. So, you know, not that many people just sit down and just write a Java program. They usually are writing Java programs in the context of an Android application or um, sometimes web applications. Uh, but, you know, Android is a very popular type of thing. So starting in 250, you'll be able to start running your apps on your Android phone if you have one. Otherwise, there's a simulator with Android Studio. Um, same thing with 300. We do um, more stuff with Android in there. So we kind of mix between programming concepts and then solving kind of real world um, smallish projects, uh, that kind of stuff. But so I would look at 250 and 300, uh, not as an Android programming class, but as a computer, as, not as an Android programming sequence, but as a computer programming sequence, but rather than everything being at the console, we see our output through an app and we have buttons that take us places and things like that. But the main focus is on the programming 
we just happen to give ourselves a nice little interface. Well, nice, I use in air quotes, but an interface <laughs> that, that lets us do something. Um, but then that also then opens the door for once you kind of catch on to Android Studio and you start having this Java skill um, that now the, the door is open for you to start writing your own Android apps and putting them up in the Google Play Store and, and making money off of them. Uh, which is a, a fairly common thing. Uh, we have several students now. Um, I started them kind of as sophomores doing this, uh, where they try to release an app per month uh, on the Google Play Store. It doesn't have to be a huge app. I kind of promote little utility apps, something that solves some problem in your real life. Now, chances are you're not going to write an app that's going to be the next Angry Birds, right? Um, but we have several students who have apps that have a fairly decent size install base, and they're making you know, 99 cents per app, you get to keep like 70 cents of that uh, when they sell it. So they have like, you know, 11 or 12 or 13 apps now. And they're selling 40 of those a month times 13. Well, that replaces a student job pretty quick, right? So if you take that, so if you have uh, 13 times 40 times 0.7, that's $364 a month from just apps that you wrote, and that's in perpetuity, assuming you keep your sales up, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it buys your books, I suppose. Yeah. But, you know, multiply that by 12, $4,300 a year, that's part of your tuition. So, something to look forward to, you'll be learning those skills in 250 and 300, and, you know, maybe you'll be money motivated to <laughs> to put the extra time into your homework and, and that kind of stuff to actually get good at the stuff. All right, any other pro any programs? Any other questions? Make sense? Okay, so uh, let's go back and let's talk about what's going to be on the um, the exam. Um, so the exam is a cumulative exam, so uh, anything is fair game from the entire semester. Having said that, I will focus on things since the midterm, i.e. more Java, less Alice. Uh, in fact, I would expect zero Alice. I think that's a... Um, in fact, I'll say Alice is not fair game. <laughs> Technically on paper, since it's cumulative, uh, it would be fair game, but I promise you I'm not going to ask an Alice question. <laughs> It'll all be, uh, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, because then that means there'll be more Java-y type questions. Um, but if we go back, let's kind of flip through some of these old sli slides. Um, I'll look at the midterm and see what specific questions I asked, as well as what questions were often missed. So if there was a, and we'll see the midterm here in a few minutes. Um, I think we have flipped through this. But, uh, um, you know, these are all fair game type questions. How do human beings solve problems? That whole mapping, memory asking questions, repetition, what's computer programming, kind of our problem that human beings are too good at solving problems. Here's that mapping. What's the job of a programming language? So all of those things are kind of fair game conceptual stuff. There'll be probably zero to one question covering those concepts you know, almost like an overarching why do computer programming and why is it difficult and, and, and that jazz. Um, uh, there might be, you know, kind of one or two questions dealing with kind of our history of our languages. So kind of the, this is our top level picture of that, if you will. Um, you know, then we talked about some of the specifics within these. Uh, so evolution of C, uh, different kinds of programming languages, functional versus procedural versus object-oriented. I won't ask anything about functional. It would only be procedural versus object-oriented, kind of that telephone, the object-oriented telephone versus the procedural telephone. I think that made it on the midterm, so probably a low chance on the final. But if I need a filler question, fair game. Um, um, so let's see, evolution of C++, what problem did it solve? Introduce the idea of object-oriented programming. Why? Why did we need that? What were some of the struggles? Um, specifically, maybe with the evolution of C++, what was its problem? Empowered programmers to make kind of bad decisions. So why did we need the next guy? Why did we need the Java C-sharp um, uh, guys? Uh, you know, that's, you know, I use the example in uh, C++ that, you know, if you're inviting me to a party, do you hand me the address of your house or hand me the house, right? So, you know, a weakness of C++ is the programmer is empowered to hand the house, 
where in uh, uh, real life that would never make sense. Having said that, sometimes real life doesn't necessarily parallel programming. So if we kind of play devil's advocate on the C++ side of things, we might say, every now and then, for whatever reason, in the application we're writing, it might actually make sense to send the house. Maybe. <laughs> All right, so, uh, um, you know, those are questions that I probably wouldn't ask things about. I wouldn't have you go too deep into, into that stuff, but this is more trivia knowledge at the top level that it's not that it never makes sense in programming, just in real life it would never make sense. But in programming, 99% of the time it doesn't make sense. Probably more than that, but whatever. Um, evolution of Java, uh, kind of the, the, the problem with Java is that, uh, in, from our perspective, is it hides too much stuff from us. So a lot of things we don't see, and we've been spending time uh, uh, the second half of the semester here really working with uh, working with Java. So that's something that maybe we have a little bit of an appreciation for. Um, concept of a pointer, uh, variable holding uh, memory addresses. So these are all things that we've really dealt with since the midterm. We were printing, we printed out objects. Whenever we use the new keyword, we typically see crazy memory address looking thing. Um, so that's kind of our evidence that pointers exist in, in Java, even though most of the textbooks say they don't. So understand what a pointer is. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, pass by value versus pass by address, an important concept. Uh, so I can certainly ask a question about that. Maybe I might say, what's the difference between pass by value, pass by address? We'll have to see. I don't remember if I specifically asked that on the midterm or not, but if I didn't, would be fairly fair game. If I did and it was often missed, um, would also be fair game. We'll have to look at, uh, I'll have to look back at the midterm. So, um, so then that follows the, con the concept of side effect. If something is passed by address, when we make changes to it, those changes are globally recognized. We've seen that recently with our bubble sort, um, which, Wikipedia called insertion sort. So I probably won't ask you on the exam to tell me uh, uh, what the, you know, the difference between those kind of sorting algorithms might be since there seems to be some confusion as to what the name of the algorithm is. I feel pretty confident it's called bubble sort. It kind of makes sense, right, that those things are bubbling to the top, but whatever. I won't hold you to the name of an algorithm if, I, uh, if the internet chooses not to agree with me because <laughs> I think we all know who's right. All right, so uh, yeah, so the idea of side effect, we've seen it in Merge Sort as well, where we're passing around that same array and changes we made to that array are globally experienced by the other calls to Merge Sort, right? So because we're changing those buckets in memory, in the actual place in memory, we're just passing around pointers uh, to that array with various begin end, you know, various positions in that array that we should be focusing in on in that particular call to Merge Sort. Um, versus passing by value. So if we had a, a function in Java and I passed an integer to it and we changed that integer inside of the, the function, primitive types in Java are passed by value. So changing that integer inside the function would not have an impact on the original integer that we passed in. All right, um, and that comes down to how variables are resolved. When I pass a value to a function, we're passing the resolved value of the variable that we pass to the function. Well, things like arrays resolve to their memory address, which is a pointer. That means when we change it, we're changing it in the actual place in memory. Integers resolve to the, their value. Their value is a literal, a numeric literal. That makes sense? All right, so that's why there's no side effect for those guys, because we, we can't change what it means for the number five to be five. We can change the value stored inside of a, uh, a variable in Java, although a more modern language like Swift has actually taken that away. Uh, by by uh, definition, values that are uh, passed by uh, parameters that are passed by value in Swift are um, set up as what are called let constants. So you can't change them. You have to create a new local variable and copy it into it if you want to make changes to it. Um, so it kind of solidifies that idea. But this concept of pass by value versus pass by address, understand what that means. Um, I might show you a, some sample code. Um, 
you know, uh, so if, if I'm going to talk about some of these older concepts, I might frame it in the, in the Java world. So I maybe will show you a, a Java function that takes in something and makes a change, something like that, and ask you, you know, does this have an impact outside of this function, something like that. So I might ask this in the context of Java. All right. Um, I probably wouldn't ask a question structs versus classes because we kind of already covered that a while ago. Um, these are trivia type co-op problems. I, I, I probably wouldn't ask things about Microsoft um, or even the... Uh, it might be fair game if I need a, a filler question. Um, some of the Java history stuff. Um, dealing with, uh, you know, how the the virtual machine works and how a program compiles down to Java bytecode and then is run by the Java virtual machine, which translates it into it's, you know, it translates it into the um, something that runs directly on the, the CPU. Uh, maybe a fair question might be something along the lines of uh, uh, explain how Java is both of is both a compiled and an interpreted language at the same time. You know, we compile from Java source code into Java bytecode. That's the compiler does what? It converts from a high level language to a low level language. That's the compiled side of Java. The interpreted side of Java is we're taking Java bytecode. The virtual machine is an interpreter that interprets it into assembly code for the CPU. That's the interpreted side of Java i.e. that's why Java isn't used to write video games or not quote real video games. Um, let's see. So three kinds of programming languages, machine, low level, high level. Um, again, fair game question. I don't know that I would specifically ask a question like list the three kinds of programming languages um, from a, a language type perspective or something like that. I might ask you something like what's the difference between a low level language and a high level language? Something like that, okay? Understanding this idea of a one-to-one -one relationship versus a one-to-many relationship. Every line of code in a low-level language, like Java bytecode or assembly language, translates into one instruction, one magic trick that the CPU knows, as opposed to every line of code we write in Java maybe turns into a whole bunch of instructions on the, um, uh, the CPU, okay? So that's a high-level language. Um, there will likely be a conversion question on there. I like conversion questions a lot. <laughs> and what I always find hilarious is when I give conversion questions to our seniors and they miss it. And you just want to punch them. Okay. But I can't do that, so I have to hire students to punch them. And then deny it. <laughs> of course, because this is all recorded. All right. Uh, let's see. So yeah, the concept of the CPU, the, you know, I like to think of them like magicians. They have a bunch of magic tricks. They do the magic tricks in a certain order and something real might happen. Again, fair game. Um, but I would probably see that, that concept being in a question kind of wrapped within this idea of, you know, difference between low level and high level languages rather than asking specifically um, about uh, the, the, the CPU itself. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of how I'll likely go about uh, uh, writing the exam, uh, I'm, you know, and I will talk in a few minutes about how many programming questions there might be on there. I'll write the programming questions first and then write filler around that. Um, the exam should be such that if you are not good at the programming and you leave them all blank, you can still pass the exam. You won't do well. <laughs> but if you got all of the memorization, you know, understanding concept type stuff right, you know, you shouldn't be able to do so much damage to your grade on the exam that it's not recoverable. Uh, the other thing I'll remind you about is uh, my policy on exams. So if you bomb the midterm and you do better on this exam, I'll replace your midterm with this exam. Not the other way around, though. If you got 100 on the midterm, you can't just zero this one and expect to have me replace the zero. That's not, you got to show me you've improved <laughs> to, to fix an old grade. All right, so uh, um, so remember that when you're preparing. If you have a particularly uh, low grade from the midterm, uh, that can make a pretty substantial difference in your final grade in the course. You know, if you're operating off a of 15% on the midterm, that was 20% of your grade. If you can replace that 15 with a 95, that's major. 
All right, so you can make complete grade turnarounds, uh, go from a, you know, oh, I might not pass to a high B in the class, something like that. So do remember that. Um, let's see. So yeah, conversion question. Um, I could see, since we've done both sides of it, I could see asking a question that has you go from like hexadecimal to octal uh, or, or something like that, which uh, um, maybe has you go to an intermediate level. I don't remember if I showed you guys the trick in here or not. If you know the trick, that's fine, but there's actually a pretty convenient way to go from hexadecimal to octal. It's actually a pretty easy question. But the intended way that I would ask that question would be convert hexadecimal to decimal using that. I know how to do that algorithm. And then from decimal to octal, showing you know the other side. Okay, How do you convert decimal to a base? How do you convert a base to decimal? All right, but there is a direct... Um, translation. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll go weird with it or something and say convert hexadecimal to base 7 or something like that. Then you can't use the trick. Okay, I mean, Base 7, just because it doesn't have a name, it's still a, a legitimate base. You know, you divide by 7, record the remainder, that's, that stuff. Okay. Um, Fair game interpreted versus compiled, but I, I, it would be lower on my priority list if I were asking something. It would be that low-level, high-level stuff. Um, purpose of a compiler, again, that falls in that same category of low-level to high-level. Java virtual machine, we already kind of discussed where that lives. VM model, we just we discussed that a few minutes ago as well. Um, I could see myself in, a, in an act of desperation asking you to maybe explain when a low-level language might be, why, why a human being might write code in a low-level language uh, today, um, you know, almost with that understanding that they're not completely antiquated, you know, that there is still a need for doing something at the low level, but uh, um, generally speaking, we wouldn't, and I would put this pretty low on the priority list. Uh, I would have to be really desperate, and I can usually come up with a lot of questions. In fact, if I remember, didn't I ask a question that we didn't even cover on the midterm? Yeah, I tend to do that. Yeah, so no guarantee that I'll ask questions that we covered. Those are always fun ones. <laughs> well, I curve them back in, right? I think I did that on the midterm. Yeah. See, that's free points. You want me to ask questions that I didn't. <laughs> that, just, that just bolsters the grade. You make something up, you know what's wrong, and all of a sudden you get 100% on it. <laughs> <laughs> I always like when I ask a question that so far off the ball that students just start drawing pictures. <laughs> like, you know, I got that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and there's all sorts of stuff. Because um, it happens every single semester, you uh, because I like my classes to kind of ev you know evolve with the you know the, the the stuff that's happening in technology. So I don't want just to use an old slide set. So we might talk about something that's now been changed. There's a new take on it. So there's something that in my mind, I think we talked about it, but we talked about it two semesters ago or something like that. And so I guess you guys become the victims or recipients of the present. I'm not sure which of the two. It's one of the two. Um, evolution of C sharp, it's really the same as, as Java. I probably wouldn't I probably wouldn't ask you anything that that would be more C sharp specific. It would be the whole Java, what's the difference between that and this in the C++ language? And really anything I asked you about uh, C, C Sharp, you can answer it the Java way and have a very high likelihood of it being accurate. They're effectively the same language. Um, uh, the .NET model is interesting, uh, though from, from a, you know, you look at Java versus C Sharp. Um, I could see maybe something about just-in-time compilers. You know, what's the purpose of those? That's the one thing that C Sharp kind of brought to the table where the very first time you run the program, it converts it into native code for that CPU. Um, that way, future runs of the program are, are fast. Uh, I would still put that pretty low on the priority list. I don't expect I would require that, that extra question. But if I do, out of this slide, that would probably be the one part I would focus in on, just-in-time compilers. Um, this is more just informational, what the big three are. Um, I won't ask anything about evolution of Objective-C. 
Um, this is more interesting history stuff. Apple buys next computers, that crap. So I won't, that won't be on the test. Um, on the test, here's our Alice uh, um, stuff. So like I said, I won't ask anything about Alice. Um, again, interesting slide, but I probably, I mean, even in the last month, I've used function and method interchangeably. These are just terms that all mean the same stuff. The reusable chunks of code type stuff. Um, uh, that whole cadence, what's a Boolean expression, any expression that boils down to a single value of true or false, that might find its way into a, uh, a question in one way or another. Uh, I doubt I would just ask it outright, what is a Boolean expression? But you should certainly understand that concept because at this point you should be able to write loops and conditionals and that kind of stuff. And Boolean expression should be relatively uh, natural for you at this point. Um, more than likely, there's going to be at least one programming question that's going to require you to understand how modulus works. I tend to like doing the whole remainder stuff and using that for interesting stuff. So make sure you review your third grade math and uh, the whole long division stuff where you have something remainder something else. Make sure you understand that. Um, I know third grade was a while ago, but is that, they, that thing, that's what they still do in third grade, right? Long division, that's when they introduce it. Or they have all, I mean, now you have the whole new math stuff. And don't they have like, is it called new math? Where they just do made up stuff? It's like... Well, you don't even have to find the answer, you just have to like, say how you would type it. Yeah, it's just dumb, right? Yeah, yeah it doesn't make any sense. Um, let's see. Yeah, so understand modulus. Um, you should understand the concept of when to use variables. I probably wouldn't ask you the question, when should we use variables? You would have to show me that you know when to use variables whenever you need to remember something. Okay. If, if I need to remember something from here and use it again later on, use a variable. That's where we put it. All right. Uh, same thing. Loops. Um, out of desperation, I could ask you a question about, uh, you know, what each loop lends itself to. For loops lend themselves to counting loops, while loops lend themselves to loops where we don't, you know, repetition where we don't necessarily know how many times we need a loop. Again, probably out of, I need an extra question, something like that. Um, uh, Similarly with pre-check loops, the do while loop, when will we um, use that? Um, fair game, but uh, low, low priority. Um, so this is really probably where the, the rubber meets the road for, uh, uh, for stuff we've done more recently is, is breaking problems down into their smallest parts. You know, so one thing that you've seen that we've been trending over the last, let's say, month is that we've been, uh, I keep throwing harder and harder problems at you conceptually. The final answer isn't necessarily some sort of behemoth program, but conceptually they're more complex problems, so that even those of you who uh, uh, have kind of caught on to the programming stuff earlier still have issues just completely conceiving of the solution in your mind. You still are forced to go to, a, go to paper and kind of come up with a solution forcing you to think about things modularly and breaking things down into I'm going to use this function and this function and this function as helper functions to solve this, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, I probably wouldn't ask you a question like what's modular programming, but you should be comfortable with thinking about every problem I give you specifically in the programming section of the exam um, and thinking how can I break this down into the smaller pieces where it's effectively like you going to Home Depot and buying tool A, tool B, and tool C because those are the three tools you're going to need to solve this problem. Make sense? So you'll write the function for A, the function for B, and the function for C, and then use those three, fun those three functions in your solution to the, the actual problem you're being asked to solve. Um, yeah, co the concept of all programs begin and end with main could be important. I might... Uh, uh, give you uh, show you a program and say what does this do and um, uh, so it could be something that has several functions in it uh, that maybe at, at a glance makes it the program look like it does lots of stuff but maybe main does something substantially trivial more trivial or, or doesn't call all those functions something like that kind of proving that you can read a program and see how it's working and follow it so always start at main and let main 
direct you where you're gonna jump from there. If main calls function A and function A calls function B and function B calls function C, and then ultimately returns, well, be able to follow the, 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 the yellow brick road to where the, the program ultimately executes. Um, okay, so this is where we started getting into some of the Java um, uh, methods and things like that. Um, this is when we were talking about recursion to some extent. Um, so understand recursion, you've had a, a, a much more uh, terrifying experience with it recently with merge sort. Um, that's always a, a good starting point for terrifying recursion because when the second you hit two recursive calls in a row, it becomes more difficult to conceptualize. So uh, hopefully most of you found that uh, program uh, computationally frustrating. Um, the this keyword, how does an object refer to itself from within itself? This would be more of a trivia question. This is kind of where 250 starts. It's when we start writing our own objects that uh, um, where this the concept of me creating an instance of this object. We did this last class when we wrote a thread. So we created our, we created our own thread object that didn't have a main in it. So that guy was his own entity. So inside of our, what did I call it, worker bee? Inside of our worker bee class, if I were to say this, I was referring to this instance of that worker bee. You know, we saw that in Alice with uh, self, right? I think, did Alice use self or use this? Use this? Okay, same, same thing. You know, how did one of our monkey kings refer to themselves within their code? They said this dot. You know, uh, whether or not I'm checked, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, so this was dealing with variable scope. Uh, I could see asking a question dealing with variable scope where maybe I uh, um, show you some code and tell, ask you to tell me, um, um, you know, maybe what the value of a certain variable is at a certain point in the program. Uh, and maybe there's a global version of that and then a more local version of that. You need to recognize that the local version takes precedence, something like that. So understand how, uh, uh, how variable scope works. Um, all right. Uh, so again, this is the recursion thing. Understand what recursion is. Um, let's see. Okay, so this is kind of where we um, hit the midterm, but a lot of those things I just talked about in that first half, I would ask questions in the context of Java. So for the midterm, you were thinking about that more in the Alice world. Now we're trying to connect it to actual code. Um, let's see. What's that? There's a conversion question. Um, it's fine. Language object oriented. All right, yeah, list the primitive types, ASCII versus Unicode. This was the one we hadn't covered, right? The Y2K bug? Yeah. So who knows? Maybe that'll show up on the final. We'll have a second opportunity to, uh, to, <laughs> to, 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 to show that you know something that I didn't teach. Um, yeah, so remember this thing was the, the, because we had, memory used to be really expensive. So older programs used the minimum amount of memory they could, so they decided to use two digits to represent a year instead of four digits to save the memory. Well, then there's a, you know, there, conceptually there isn't a difference between uh, 1900 and 2000. So that's where the Y2K bug needed to be fixed. Uh, I don't know if I would ask it, but if I need a filler question, I kind of like that question, clearly, since I asked it when I didn't taught it. Um, okay. And this stuff was more just evidence of how expensive memory used to be. Okay. Strongly typed versus loosely typed. Um, I don't think I ever... Uh, did we do did we, this? This was after the midterm, the bitwise stuff, right? I could see myself asking a bitwise question. I think I had promised it on a quiz and we never did that, right? Yeah, so I could see maybe that. So remember, with bitwise, it's um, that's the single ampersand or the single uh, uh, vertical bar the pipe um, uh, instead of the double ampersand, and that expects you to have numeric values on both sides. And what it does is it looks at the binary version 
of those numeric values, and it does ands on a bit-by-bit -bit basis. So this is 1 and 1 is 1. 0 and 1 is 0. 1 and 1 is 1. 1 and 0 is 0. Make sense? And ORs would work the same way ORs work, but it does it on a bit-by-bit -bit basis to give you the final result. Um, yeah, so I can see asking that question. Um, that one would certainly come ahead of some of the other ones where I mentioned I would have to be desperate. I can see me purposely asking this question on a bitwise conversion. Probably would not take over um, the... That wouldn't be a, a replacement for the other conversion questions. So I would expect at least one, if not two, conversion questions. And if there's a second, it would be this kind, a bitwise. All right, so we talked about strings quite a bit. Um, so definitely understand strings, understand the, uh, the functions associated with strings. Length, char at, index of. Um, so uh, be prepared to... Uh, uh, be able to read that kind of stuff as well as use those uh, uh, methods in some of the programming questions. Um, so you will almost certainly have one programming question that involves stream manipulation at some level. Okay. Uh, static versus non-static. Um, Definitely fair game. I'll, uh, I very likely will ask some question dealing with this concept, whether I say, um, uh, show you some code and say, tell me how to call this, something like that, uh, or um, uh, ask you to write a, um, maybe one of the programming questions, I ask you to write a class method that solves, that does something. So I would expect you to translate class method into you having to put the static keyword out front. Um, because now we've seen both. We've seen both sides of it. We've called uh, string methods, uh, which are non-static, and we've, called, we've written our own methods inside of our driver class that are static. So if I ask you to write a class method, put static. If I ask you to write an instance method, don't put static. It might be my you know, easy way of asking that question without wasting a question on the exam to ask that question. You know, it might be worth a point of the 10 points for that question or something like that. Were you able to differentiate between a class method and an instance method? Um, so string manipulation is a big deal. Understand uh, index of. Um, so be able to, if I write some code and ask you to read it, be able to look at some code that uses index of from a string and know kind of what that's doing. Um, specifically, the index of kind of secret weapon, that whole and that returns a negative one if it's not found. That's a pretty powerful tool. Um, I mean, plus, plus, minus, minus, be able to read it. You can certainly use it in your solutions. I probably would not ask a question like, what's the output difference between system.out.println a plus plus and system.out.println plus plus a. That was more know it if you ever look at code on Google or something like that. Uh, but I doubt I'll test you on it. It's still important concepts. Um, so this is more of a, a, a function that we that we wrote. Uh, I wouldn't ask you to duplicate this that we already wrote it, but uh, certainly something along these lines where this is string manipulation stuff. Walk a string, get the individual characters from the string, do something with them, something like that. Uh, maybe I ask you to remove spaces from a string, something like that, which would then have you rebuild a new string or those types of things. Be able to manipulate strings using the tools that we have in our toolbox. Uh, similarly, if I were to provide you with a tool, I might say, here's a method that exists in the string class, whether it exists or not. I might invent a method and give you the, 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 the method header for it and tell you what it does and ask you to solve some problem that uses that that function. So you'd have to show me that you know how to call it, and if I've told you it returns a value that looks like A, B, C, how might you utilize that? Um, probably wouldn't waste a question on this, but the, the punchline is, is that, you know, why, why wouldn't we use methods from the integer class? 
uh, or why, why would they be static as opposed to instance methods? We already have ways of holding ints through prim primitives. But since primitive types can only hold values, they, they don't have the ability to do extra stuff. So we need these integer objects and character objects in order to do things to ints, do things to chars, that kind of stuff. Um, but I doubt that would show up as a direct question, but it could. Fair game. Uh, here's your conversion stuff. More string manipulation uh, type type things, doing conversion things. Here's us inter introducing the substring uh, function, so that would be fair game for your toolbox. Um, concept of polymorphism, I, that could be a question. I, I tend to like polymorphism, so I, I would expect that to find its way onto the exam in one way or another. Polymorphism, the concept in one way or another. Um, yeah, the various uh, members of a class. So, uh, you know, what what are the members of a class and what is each one for? So fields, constructors, methods. It's almost like a regurgitation of this of this slide and understanding those things. Or I might give you show you a class and ask you to identify which things are fields, which things are constructors, which things are methods, something along those lines. Um, okay, these are more. So the equals method of the string class, so that's in your toolbox. Um, you know, I wouldn't ask you to like write a bubble sort from memory or insertion sort, whatever. Um, but, you know, algorithms of kind of that level of complexity uh, might be a little bit beyond what I would ask on the, on the exam. So if you think of uh, bubble sort, obviously, as being substantially simpler than merge sort, as an example, the types of programming questions you might expect on the exam would be simpler than bubble sort, okay? Because I, I obviously want you to be able to solve it in the class period, right? Um, so it would be more of show me that you can can use some of these tools to solve relatively simple problems rather than problems that I would expect you to spend an hour drawing pictures on, or pictures of for a homework assignment, okay? So there'll be simpler problems that are mini versions of the things you've dealt with. Uh, there's our merge sort. Um, probably won't ask a question about big O notation. Fair game, but I'd have to be really desperate. Um, it's more just an idea. doesn't really mean much. Uh, certainly, there could be questions about the Grace Cookout. Okay. Um, who won the skeet shooting championship in the fourth round? That kind of stuff. Uh, let's see. Um, more recently, I could see a question maybe on synchronous versus asynchronous. Um, it wouldn't be a high priority, but I can see asking a question about this more so than some of those other low priority ones from before the midterm. Um, same thing with the inter-process communication stuff, but I probably, uh, I would say there's a really, really, really low chance of something from this slide being on there. I, if I had to waste a question for something, it would be on this. Synchronous versus asynchronous. I think that's a pretty uh, important global concept. And then more recently, we talked about the, uh, um, the thread class. I could see possibly asking about design patterns in general. We just introduced it, but that's a pretty important thing. Um, and then maybe even MVC. Uh, maybe I'll wrap those into one question if I were to ask. Uh, we didn't talk about the other two, but we'll, we will next semester. But um, uh, also, I, won't, I probably won't ask you about interfaces. We didn't get far enough into it to really experience it. But all right. Uh, questions, comments, uh, oh, last thing, so exam will probably be 10 questions long, most of my exams are. I try to design it to take about uh, an hour if you know what you're doing, but you have the full two hours to do it. So hopefully it isn't a time crunch type thing. If it is, then you probably aren't really where you need to be, but you know, it's hopefully within the next year and a half you will be. So, <laughs> all right, any questions, comments, concerns, bribes, uh, exam is what day? Wednesday at 10, 10 a.m. right here. All right. I will see everybody then.